Welcome back, everyone, to my top 100 games of all time, or 100 top 100 games that I like for right now. Let's go with that if you missed the first part. Uh, so the first list we had from 100 to 51, we are back with 50 to number one. Hopefully we don't get to number one and you're like, oh my goodness, this is terrible, or maybe you'll be like, this is awesome, or have no reaction at all. Either way, hopefully it's somewhat fun to watch. <laughs> so. Join me as we count from 50 to number one. Number 50. Number 50, Mission Red Planet. In each round, players secretly choose a character card from their hand, and this determines when they place astronauts on the spaceships awaiting launch to Mars and which special action they take during the round. Players collect resources three times during the game, and they have a secret mission card that may garner them additional points at the end of the game. This is a game that could easily teach to my lighter gaming friends and they would feel just as challenged but not overwhelmed. It plays up to six and, well, we played at that count often. I think they all just like saying liftoff. Number 49. Number 49, the Castles of Burgundy. The Castles of Burgundy requires players to take settlement tiles, which have special functions from the game board, and place them onto their player board, their princedom. The princedom itself consists of several regions, each of which demands its own type of settlement tile. The game ends after five rounds. So this is a game where you have a lot of actions from which to choose and you never seem to have enough turns in which to do them. The art isn't my favorite, but the gameplay is pretty solid. I quite like that you can garner points by completing small sections of land on your board. Number 48. Number 48, Firefly the Game. So this is based on the television series. Players begin with a ship and travel from planet to planet, hiring crew, purchasing ship upgrade, and picking up cargo to deliver jobs, all in the form of cards. Not everyone or everything is legal. Completing jobs are necessary because it gets you cash. The first player to complete the story goals wins. This game is large in size and large in gameplay. It can be lengthy, but if you really immerse yourself into the story, you don't even notice the time. It has high replayability and is highly thematic. Yes, the paper money is fantastic. I'm always aiming to misbehave. Number 47. Number 47, Vanuatu. To be successful, you need to manage with natural resources, rare items, Vatus, the local currency, and tourists. To earn money or prosperity points, you may also tap into your artistic side by drawing in the sand, carry tourists all over Vanuatu Islands, or trade cargo with foreign countries. This game has all the things that normally I do not enjoy, for example, programming, and, well, it can be kind of mean. Well, a lot mean. I've had great experience playing this game, and I think I quite enjoy the point salad nature of the game. Let's just say that it's quite interactive for a Euro game. Number 46. Number 46, P. Mal Flaumen, or Plums. On a turn, players play one fruit card from their hand at a time. Then they each claim one of the played cards based on the strength of the card that they played. Each card shows a fruit, and some of the cards also feature a scoring pattern or a special action. For example, gaining plum cards, stealing cards, or collecting pie cards. The game is not super deep, but the art is lovely, and I like the way it takes on trick-taking. I like the use of the pie cards, as it makes it a little bit more interesting. Who doesn't like winning a hand by 3.14159265359? Number 45. Number 45, Alhambra. Players are acquiring buildings to be placed within their Alhambra complex. On a turn, players may take money from the open money market, purchase a building from the building market and either place it in their Alhambra or reserve, or engage in construction and reconstruction projects with buildings that have been placed in the player's Alhambra or reserve. I like this game because it's relatively straightforward, but introduces players to set collection and some economic elements. Number 44. Number 44, Kingsburg. Kingsburg takes place over five years, and in every year there are three production seasons for collecting resources, building structures, and training troops. Every fourth turn is the winter, in which all the players must fight an invading army. 
Players use their dice in the council. Each member provides a different benefit to build structures and train troops. This is one of the first games that I played when I forayed into the modern board game scene. And it's rather simple, but I don't mind that. I like that you could customize the path you wanted to take based on the abilities you chose to unlock. Simple, yet satisfying. Number 43. Number 43, Luna. Players are the heads of the orders who try to convince the priestess of themselves. Over the course of six rounds, they need to collect as many influence points as possible by building new shrines, working at the temple, participating in the priestess's divine services, and recruiting additional novices. I know that this game can be kind of mean, but like other Felds, I enjoy the various ways to accumulate points by navigating through the different islands and building your path on Temple Island, even if it means bumping someone else off. Oops. Number 42. Number 42, San Juan. San Juan is a card game based on Puerto Rico. The cards consist of production buildings, indigo, sugar, tobacco, coffee, and silver, and violet buildings that grant special powers or extra victory points. Cards from the hand can be either built or used as money to build something else. Cards from the deck are used to represent goods produced by the production buildings, in which case they are left face down. San Juan's quick setup and gameplay make it a good choice if you want to play a game with interesting decisions, but you don't have the time to play a longer game. It's simple enough for players to catch on to and it provides some fun competition. Tactics, economic, and strategy are all part of the variability of this game. It is often overlooked because everyone is so focused on Puerto Rico, but that isn't on my list. Or is it? Number 41. Number 41, Stone Age. In Stone Age, players collect wood, break stone, and wash their gold from the river. They trade freely, expand their village to achieve new levels of civilization. I really like Stone Age, and I think it's a great game to introduce players to worker placement mechanics. There are strategy and planning, and you need to prioritize your actions each turn, and also come up with alternative actions as opponents may beat you to your goal. Stone Age is an excellent game and a great example of a worker placement Euro style game. Number 40. Number 40, Pastiche. In Pastiche, players choose commission cards and score their commissions by mixing primary colors through tile placement and recreating the palette of colors used by the painters who created them. A great way to learn about colors and plays well with anyone. The art theme is interesting to me and I really like the quality of components. It is a strategic and tactical game, albeit not a deep game, but it has an alluring puzzle and set collection component. Number 39. Number 39, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle is a cooperative deck building game where four students keep the school safe by defeating villains. Players take on the role of a Hogwarts student, Harry, Ron, Hermione, or Neville, each with their own personal deck of cards that they will use to acquire resources. I was skeptical of the artwork, so I almost gave this game a hard pass, but the theme and ease of cooperative gameplay drew me in. I like that it was true to the story and became increasingly more difficult as the game progressed. Number 38. Number 38, Century Gollum Edition. Century Gollum Edition is a rethemed version of Century Spice Road. Players are caravan leaders who travel the world to deliver crystals. Players can establish a trade route, make a trade to harvest crystals, fulfill a demand, or rest. The last round is triggered once a player has claimed their fifth victory point card. This game holds a special place on the list because it plays well a variety of player counts, it's easy to teach and learn, and it was showcased at an event where I first met Mr. Tom Vassell. His squeeze of glee when playing this game made me want to check it out. Number 37. Number 37, Elf Nimt. In Elf Nimt, or Eleven Takes It, the cards are numbered 1 to 100 and each has a number of bullheads. Players start with 10 cards in hand and try to discard all of their cards to win the round. The first player with no cards in hand receives zero points, while everyone else loses points equal to the number of bullheads on their cards in hand. This game is quick, light, and fun. Take a pile gets yelled out a lot when we play. 
this happens when one can't play a card within the 10 point range. They have to then go and take a pile. Definitely a winner with my game group. Number 36. Number 36, Millennium Blades. Millennium Blades is a CCG simulator, a game in which you play as a group of friends who play the fictional CCG Millennium Blades. You build decks, play the meta, acquire valuable collections, snag boosters, and compete in tournaments for prizes and fame. The whole playing a game inside of another game totally appeals to me. I also really love the time choosing of cards and playing the tournaments. This game understands me. Number 35. Number 35, Carcassonne. Carcassonne is a tile placement game in which the players draw and place tiles. The tile may have a city, a road, a cloister, grassland, or a combination, and it must be placed adjacent to tiles that have already been played to make connections. When areas are complete, that meeple scores points for its owner. This is a classic lay strategy game and is high on many lists because it can be played by many via the actual board game or on the addictive app. Number 34. Number 34, Deep Sea Adventure. In Deep Sea Adventure, players are explorers trying to gain treasures in the deep blue sea. Players want to bring the most ruined ships back to the submarine, but you are on limited oxygen. At the end of three rounds, the players with the most points wins. The fact that I could play this with my heavy gamer group and we could all have a good laugh about us not making it back to the submarine and scoring low to zero points, well, I knew that it had to stay in the collection. It also shows that we are really greedy. <laughs> this is probably one of my most played games. Number 33. In Patchwork, players compete to try and complete the highest scoring Patchwork quilt. This is one of a few games that my mom really enjoys. The theme of quilting is fun, and we both enjoy the challenge of trying to strategically place the right pieces to cover more of our board. We had to stop playing on the floor due to my dog's affinity for the neutral token, but the game is definitely staying in the collection. Number 32. Number 32, Lords of Waterdeep. In Lords of Waterdeep, you can gain points or resources through completing quests, constructing buildings, playing entry cards, or having other players use the buildings that you have constructed. At the end of eight rounds, the player with the most points wins. While the D&D theme is a bit pasted on, most laugh it off and enjoy the charms of the actual game. It's a fun worker placement that allows you to complete quests, gather resources, and build. My friends who are not active gamers quite enjoy this one, so it stays on my shelf. I enjoy it too. Number 31. Number 31, number nine. In number nine, players place number tiles based on cards drawn on the table or on top of another number tile already in play. Once all the cards have been drawn and the tiles placed, players take turns calculating their score. Higher levels are awarded more points. Most points wins. This game makes everyone think carefully and I like that. It has simple components yet they can be so frustrating, but in a good way. You need to have a solid base to eventually create viable scoring options later on. Win or lose, you'll definitely want to play it again. Number 30. Number 30, Keeper. Keeper is a worker placement game where one player places a keeple on a country board. Another player can join them with a matching colored keeple on the first player's turn to the benefit of both players. There are boards that change with the different seasons. I enjoy the debate between wanting to take certain actions and adding your keeples to boards which other players can later take. Sometimes being a follower is a good thing as it allows you to piggyback on other players' actions. The decisions are real, and I like it. Number 29. Number 29, Quinto. Quinto is a roll and write where players play simultaneously with everyone trying to fill the rows on their score sheets with high numbers as quickly as possible in order to score the most points. This is the type of game that I can carry with me and play anywhere and with anyone. It's also a fairly straightforward game to teach and as with dice, it can be anyone's game. Number 28. Number 28, Bruxelles 1893. Bruxelles 1893 is a worker placement game with some bidding and majority control. Each player is an architect of the late 19th century and is trying to achieve an architectural work in the Art Nouveau style. 
successful building and creating works of art yields the most points. Games with a variety of ways to score points are always a winner in my books. If you were not great with money, you can take certain actions, but you had to give up a meeple instead. Lots of options, and this is great. Number 27. Number 27, Fury of Dracula. Fury of Dracula is a one against many game. Hunters take actions during the day and night in order to track and kill Dracula. Count Dracula wins if he advances his influence track to 13. However, the hunters win if they defeat him before that happens. I love the theme and the interaction amongst players. It doesn't hit the table weekly, but we definitely feel the need to hunt every so often. Number 26. Number 26, London. In London, players use cards and their actions to try to build a prosperous city whilst trying to keep poverty at a minimum. I like the fact that what you do during the game is equally important as what happens at the end of the game. If you don't repay those loans, you will pay with interest at the end of the game. Everyone has a chance for victory no matter what type of game scorer you are. I'm an in-game scorer in case you were wondering. Number 25. Number 25, Orléans. Orléans is a bag building and worker placement where players assemble farmers, merchants, knights, monks, and all other sorts to gain supremacy through trade, construction, and science in medieval France. This game bears a lot of similarity to another game that you will see later on my list. I am definitely a big fan of the bag building. You know what's in the bag, but I like the surprise of when I get things. Playing the deluxe version first spoiled it for me, but I got over it when I realized how much I enjoyed the gameplay. Number 24. Number 24, Altiplano. Altiplano is a bag building game, much like Orléans, but set in the South American highlands of the Andes. Players deliver the right goods at the right time, develop the road, and store their goods to fill their rows for end game points. I love Orléans, but this placed a smidge higher due to the cuteness of the alpacas. I like that you can build your warehouse and use actions on your board to further movement in order to collect resources or strengthen your actions. It can be lengthy, but who's watching the time when you're having fun? Number 23. Number 23, Libertalia. Libertalia is a pirate-themed card game where players compete by using the same crew members and their abilities at the right time to gain treasures and points. Pirates are not really my thing, so the theme is not one of the reasons this game is on my list. It's one of those games where cards have abilities and how and when you play them can have some major effects for you and potentially others. It does have a little bit of that take that element, but everyone is having too much fun to take it personally. Or so I hope. Number 22. Number 22, Bruges. Bruges is a strategic card game where players are merchants who maintain relationships with those in power in the city while competing for influence, power, and status. A popular Stefan Feld game, and with good reason. I like the use of cards and being able to use their special abilities. If you gather the right cards, you can really affect your opponents. It doesn't overstay its welcome, and it's a nice foray into Feld Town. Number 21. Number 21, Star Realms. Star Realms is a spaceship combat deck building game where players use ships and bases for trade or to generate combat to attack your opponent. A relatively straightforward deck builder that hits you like a catchy song. You just can't get enough and that is why I also have the app. I like this game because it plays in a relatively short amount of time. It's also a game that with enough plays, which I'm sure you'll have, allows you to become a formidable competitor. Number 20. Number 20, Wits and Wagers. Wits and Wagers is a trivia game that lets you bet on anyone's answer. You can win by making educated guesses, by playing the odds, or by knowing your friends. This game is a quick teach and everyone picks it up rather quickly. Everyone always wants to play longer than the seven rounds. That's a sign of a good game. Maybe they'll come out with question cards that relate to Canadian or international trivia. Hmm. Number 19. Number 19, Nippon. Nippon is an area control game where players try to develop their web of power by investing in new industries, improving their technological knowledge, shipping goods, and growing their influence in the era of industrialization of Japan. 
There is a lot to learn in this game, but it is so worth it. It is a complex and heavy strategy game and the game flows well. There are some mechanisms which were quite helpful and allow you to keep up in this game. Can we say consolidate? There isn't a lot of player interaction, but you are having so much fun for being a boss, well, that you don't really notice or care. Number 18. Number 18, The Manhattan Project, Energy Empire. Energy Empire is a worker placement, tableau building, and resource management game where players build their nation by obtaining resources, building structures, and tapping sources of energy. I like the comboing that you can do in this game, and it's less take that than its predecessor, Manhattan Project. So if that's not something you're into, don't like that take that element, this is the better option for you. It's well designed, and it has a fantastic rulebook. Number 17. Number 17, 21. 21 is a roll and write where players roll dice, match dice, and try to finish their rows before the rest of the players. This is high on my list because my work colleagues love it and ask to play it often. Sometimes the simplest games are the most fun. Number 16. Number 16, Five Tribes. Five Tribes is a worker placement where players drop different colored meeples on tiles to activate their abilities of assassins, elders, builders, merchants, and viziers. Simple mechanics, yet being thoughtful is important, not only in placement, but what type of meeple you are placing. Analysis paralysis is a real thing in this game, which affects everyone at some point as the board keeps changing. I love games that affect everyone. It's rather delightful. Number 15. Number 15, Clank. Clank is a deck builder dungeon crawl type game where players delve into the Dragon's Mountain lair to steal precious artifacts. Not a huge fan, as I've said before, of deck builders, but I love it used with other mechanics such as, in this case, a dungeon crawl. This is also a game that I can play with gamers and my family and I can still have the same amount of fun. Number 14. Number 14, Glass Road. In Glass Road, players use a wheel to manage resource production, play specialists, and assemble the best combination of buildings. The wheel that manages the resources is quite clever and you really have to be cognizant of what you need in order to build more tiles and progress. It's an Uwe game that isn't high in difficulty, but how you manage resources, cards, and tiles can really make the game interesting. Number 13. Number 13, Avenue. Avenue is a quick line drawing roll and write where players draw a network of roads on their player sheet, trying to connect their farms and castles to grapes. I really like that this game can accommodate a large group of people and you can play it in person or even via video conference online. My score is always absolutely abysmal, but it's always a hit with the game groups. Number 12. Number 12, Elder Sign. Elder Sign is a cooperative dice game where players take the roles of investigators racing against time to ward off the impending return of the Ancient One. I just can't resist dice rolling and a creepy theme. I like the cooperative aspect of this game as well as the ease of play. It's tough to beat, but easy enough to teach those newer to gaming. Number 11. Number 11, Heaven and Ale. In Heaven and Ale, players lead an ancient monastery and its brewery by upgrading their cloister's garden and harvesting the resources to fill their barrels. I really enjoy this game because it forces you into some tough decisions. This game also encourages you to be efficient in a turn. I'm speaking particularly about the monks, which are great for pushing forward on your resource track. It's simple to teach and learn, but don't be surprised by the brutal system of the game when you finish with a low score and ask yourself, what did I do wrong? You'll want to play it again to find out. Number 10. Number 10, Food Chain Magnate. Food Chain Magnate is a heavy strategy game about building a fast food chain by managing human resources, purchasing, sales, and effective marketing. True to a splatter game, this is a challenge and is unforgiving. I love the theme and concept of the game and perhaps its connection to human resources and how a business function really hits home. It is a challenging game of which I just can't get enough. Number 9 Number 9, Dead of Winter Dead of Winter is a horror zombie cooperative survival game where you are trying to complete your secret objective and keep the colony alive. 
This game is a tough teach and zombie themes are often overdone, but once you get the hang of it, the game is challenging in trying to stay alive and if applicable, trying to determine who is the betrayer. Number eight. Number eight, Mansions of Madness, second edition. Mansions of Madness is a cooperative app-driven board game where players are investigators who face a variety of mysterious scenarios. I struggle with where to place Cthulhu-based games, but the app integration was appropriate and everyone could immerse themselves in this experience. So, that's a plus for me. Number seven. Number seven, The Gallerist. In The Gallerist, players try and build their fortune by running the most lucrative gallery and secure their reputation as a world-class gallerist. I love the theme, the components, and execution of this game. I also found it rather intuitive and an enjoyable and interesting experience. It placed higher than other Lacerda games on my list because it was intuitive and it made it to the table more often. Number six. Number six, Russian Railroads. Russian Railroads is a worker placement game where players try and build the largest and most advanced railway network. You are mostly working from your own board, but you share the train tiles and are vying for the action spaces and engineers who can be most useful. The dynamic between players is wonderful as you all try to capture resources, and I love that you score after each round. It gives players a good picture of where they stand. Number five. Number five, Village. Village is a set collection worker placement game where players try to find fame and glory in many different ways. Just remember that time is not on your side. This is a game where having family in the graveyard is not a bad thing. Higher level workers or family are necessary when trying to complete certain actions on the board. This is one of my early worker placement favorites. Number four. Number four, Amerigo. In Amerigo, using a cube tower, players explore the islands of South America, secure trading routes, and build settlements. The tower is what sold me, as it denotes how much of an action is possible. Like many of his other games, you have many ways to obtain or potentially lose points. Those darn pirates. Number three. Number three, Trajan. Trajan uses a Mancala mechanism, which players use to take actions to increase their influence and power using political influence, trading, and military dominion. This game gets a lot of flack for being a mishmash of many of Steffenfeld's games, but it has proven that any mind can play it and develop a strategy for enjoyment or winning. Number two. Number two, Caverna the Cave Farmers. Caverna the Cave Farmers is a worker placement and redesign of Agricola, which focuses on farming. I skipped right over Agricola and went straight to Caverna. There are more options and it's less restrictive. This is one of the few games that I've played solo and quite enjoyed it. And number one. And the number one game is Viticulture Essential Edition. Viticulture Essential Edition is a worker placement game where players try to create a successful winery. It's a lot of fun, easy to teach, engaging, and appeals to many. That's why it's my number one. So there you have it. That is my top 100 games list. I hope you all enjoyed it. And maybe we'll do another one next year. I think Tom's just happy I got this one in by the end of the year, sort of. <laughs> so that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.